Hello, my name is Professor Barbara Burton. I'm a professor of pediatrics at the Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine in Chicago, Illinois, USA. Thank you for joining me today for this Touch Expert Opinions, exploring how we may improve the patient journey for people living with alpha manosidosis. First, we will look at the importance of early recognition and how this can support much needed early diagnosis of alpha manosidosis. After considering the route to timely and accurate diagnosis, we will look at the role of current and emerging targeted therapies in addressing long-term needs to optimize outcomes for people living with alpha manosidosis. Well, for starters, alpha manosidosis is a rare and really ultra rare uh, and ultra orphan lysosomal storage disorders. We talk very frequently about rare disorders, but this one is extremely rare with an estimated incidence or prevalence of approximately 0.1 per 100,000 individuals or about one in a million. Uh, in addition to its rarity, we see great variability in the severity of the disorder and in the spectrum of clinical manifestations observed in affected individuals. Again, because of the rarity, there's relatively little understanding of the disease natural history and often little education about the disorder uh, among individuals in the medical community. And this leads to delayed recognition of the diagnosis, or in many cases, lack of diagnosis or underdiagnosis. Well, we know that like other lysosomal storage disorders, uh, there is a spectrum of severity associated with alpha manosidosis meaning that symptoms can arise uh, in very young individuals or not until uh, later in childhood or even early adult life. So for um, ease in thinking about uh, the disorder, it's been divided into three subtypes, types one, two, and three, with type three being the most severe form of the disorder associated with manifestations in very early childhood and often with early mortality. One of the prominent features of this very severe form uh, has to do with the skeletal abnormalities that are seen, but we also see other typical manifestations of lysosomal disorders like coarse facial features or hepatosplenomegaly, and the disease progresses rapidly. Uh, in type 2, which is the most common form of the disorder, we see symptoms a little bit later in childhood with clinical recognition usually occurring before the age of 10 years, again with skeletal abnormalities being prominent but with relatively slower progression than in the type 3. And many patients with this, uh, this intermediate form or type 2 develop uh, symptoms of ataxia in early adult life. And then finally, the mildest or more attenuated form is referred to as type 1, and this is usually not recognized until after 10 years of age. The skeletal abnormalities are not prominent, and the disorder is really very slowly progressive, so many times you may see a patient and think that they have a static condition as opposed to a progressive one because of this very slow progression. Uh, and so really have to rely on the specific clinical findings that are observed. Well, this is a multisystemic disorder like many lysosomal storage disorders. So many different symptoms can be affected as you see in the slide, but very prominently, the central nervous system is affected with intellectual disability being a very consistent clinical observation. 
This can be accompanied by findings like ataxia or with psychiatric symptomatology, and there are some patients who develop hydrocephalus. We can also see evidence of a myopathy with muscle weakness, decreased mobility. Uh, in the eyes, we can see corneal opacities. Uh, hearing impairment is a very, very important feature. So the combination of intellectual disability and hearing impairment should always suggest the possibility of alpha manosidosis. These are among the most consistent findings. Uh, in addition, we can see in the younger patients, as I mentioned earlier, some of the more typical features we associated with uh, lysosomal disorders like changes in the facial appearance, coarsening of the facial features, hepatosplenomegaly, and hernias. And some of those findings that I just mentioned may remind you of the mucopolysaccharide storage disorders. And there is considerable overlap in the clinical manifestations of the MPS disorders and what we see in the patients with the more severe forms of alpha manosidosis. Another important feature of the disorder is immunodeficiency. So patients may present with recurrent infections as a result of their immunoglobulin deficiencies. So any combination of these findings that I've mentioned should really alert you to the diagnosis. Again, in the older patients who have the more attenuated forms of the disorders of the disorder, it's going to primarily be intellectual disability uh, and hearing loss, as well as occasionally some of the other neuropsychiatric findings, such as ataxia or psychiatric symptoms. Whereas in the younger patients, you may have more of the other multisystemic manifestations. I think there are a number of approaches that can be taken to help improve the early recognition of alpha manosidosis. One of these, of course, is physician education, raising awareness of the con condition among both family physicians and primary care practitioners, but also among specialists who may see patients with some of the specific manifestations of the disorder, for example, hearing loss or uh, hepatosplenomegaly. Uh, I know I had a patient referred to me from a hepatologist who was seeing the patient for hepatosplenomegaly and suspected a storage disorder. So I think it's important for both primary care and specialist physicians to have some awareness of this. Uh, but really, in the end, um, newborn screening would be the most effective way of making sure that we identify every patient with alpha manosidosis at the earliest possible time. We are moving gradually into doing newborn screening for many of the lysosomal disorders. Uh, alpha manosidosis is not among them as yet, uh, but it may be possible at some point in time to integrate newborn screening for this disorder into our newborn screening programs. Uh, of course, we also need to improve access to health care for patients uh, who live in rural areas or, or are not near specialty clinics so that they have the opportunity to get a diagnosis if they present with uh, typical clinical symptoms. So I think all of these things are, are really very important. Uh, in addition, we need more information on the natural history. And to this end, there is uh, a patient registry that has been developed in an attempt to develop uh, and augment some of this real world data. Hello, my name is Professor Barbara Burton. I'm a professor of pediatrics at the Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine in Chicago, Illinois, USA. Thank you for joining me today for this Touch Expert Opinions, exploring how we may improve the patient journey for people living 
with alpha manosidosis. First, we will look at the importance of early recognition and how this can support much needed early diagnosis of alpha manosidosis. After considering the route to timely and accurate diagnosis, we will look at the role of current and emerging targeted therapies in addressing long-term needs to optimize outcomes for people living with alpha manosidosis. Well, certainly uh, there are some changes that we see with age of presentation because as we've discussed in an earlier module, there is a spectrum of severity associated with alpha manosidosis with some patients having earlier onset of symptoms and uh, slower progression uh, and perhaps not showing as many of the multisystemic symptoms as we see in the very young children. So if we look first at younger children under 10 years of age, uh, we are certainly going to look for speech and developmental delay because intellectual disability is really a hallmark of the disorder at, at any age. And this and the young child, of course, would be manifested by developmental delay, often most prominent in speech. Uh, hearing loss, again, one of the hallmarks of the disorder at any age, but we see this in the young, young children as well. And then in these younger children, we may also see skeletal abnormalities such as kyphosis or kyphoscoliosis, or perhaps a patient gets x-rays for some unrelated reason and a radiologist may call out uh, skeletal abnormalities on x-ray, similar to what we see in the MPS storage disorder. So finding suggestive of that constellation that's referred to as dysostosis multiplex. In addition, we may see alterations in the facial features, coarsening of the facial features. We may see recurrent infections in these young children, and you may see hepatosplenomegaly. But uh, we don't necessarily expect to see all of these things in every patient. So any combination of these findings could suggest the diagnosis of alpha manosidosis. Now, as we get into the older patients over the age of 10 years, the real hallmarks of the disorder are hearing loss and intellectual disability. And this may be accompanied by uh, psychiatric symptoms, uh, by neurologic findings such as ataxia. And you may also, again, see skeletal abnormalities, but they tend to be less prominent than in the younger patients. So uh, radiographic features will be there, uh, but you may not necessarily see the, the prominent kyphosis, for example, that we might see in a young child. The other finding related to the skeletal system that we do see, though, is a polyarthropathy. So patients may have, it, have complaints of joint pain uh, that usually involves multiple joints. Uh, so these are the things, really. And again, any combination of these findings should suggest the possibility of alpha manosidosis. Of course, other diagnoses will be in the differential as well, but testing for alpha manosidosis should be part of the patient evaluation. Well, the first step in reaching a diagnosis of alpha manosidosis is, of course, considering the disorder on clinical grounds. And unless the physician considers the possibility the patient will never get an accurate diagnosis. So being familiar with the clinical signs and symptoms, thinking about the possibility, looking at the patient for other things that might go along the, with the diagnosis of alpha manosidosis is really key. And we talked about uh, some of those features, the facial changes, the musculoskeletal findings, hearing loss, uh, intellectual uh, disability, immunodeficiency, Often the first step in arriving at a diagnosis of alpha manosidosis involves doing some biochemical testing, typically in urine. 
You may look at a patient and suspect that you're dealing with a lysosomal storage disorder. In some cases, you may not be able to distinguish between a, a mucopolysaccharidosis, an MPS disorder, and a glycoprotein storage disease like alpha manosidosis. So you may order both urine glycosaminoglycans to screen for the MPS disorders and urine oligosaccharides, which would be the test that would be helpful for alpha manosidosis. Urine glycosaminoglycans are normal in this condition, so that testing will only be helpful in ruling out another group of conditions with overlapping manifestations. You really need to order the urine oligosaccharides to detect the changes associated with alpha manosidosis. And what you typically see in this disorder is high levels of the mannose-rich oligosaccharides. Uh, subsequently, when you see this finding, or in some cases, you may decide to go directly to enzymatic testing, this would be the next step. So uh, we can measure the level of the enzyme that's deficient in alpha manosidosis, uh, the alpha manosidase, in a peripheral blood sample. This is typically done in peripheral blood leukocytes. And what we find is that patients with alpha manosidosis typically have less than 5 to 10 percent of the normal level of alpha manosidase in the blood. And this really provides confirmation of the diagnosis. Once we have the enzymatic deficiency documented, uh, we would typically like to detect the specific gene mutations or variants in the patient. And that is done with genetic testing, molecular testing, of the uh, MAN2B1 gene, which is the gene that results in the production of the alpha manosidase enzyme. And so we expect to find two variants in the gene in a patient who is affected. Now, sometimes what we find is that individuals might jump to the genetic testing first. The genetic testing is actually not required for confirmation of the diagnosis. You, you can be certain of the diagnosis if you have the urine testing and the enzymatic deficiency uh, documented. But sometimes you may get whole exome sequencing, for example, because you don't know what the diagnosis is in the patient. You maybe aren't thinking of alpha manosidosis, but you see a patient who has uh, findings that leads you to believe you may be dealing with a genetic disorder. Maybe it's the intellectual disability and hearing. Perhaps the patient looks a little different, but you can't really put your finger on it. So increasingly, we see people doing whole exome sequencing. And of course, that will also detect the gene variants in uh, alpha manosidosis. Well, although we typically find two pathogenic variants in uh, the gene in patients with alpha manosidosis, thus far we have no clearly established genotype-phenotype correlation. So we can't predict that a patient is going to have more severe or more attenuated disease, for example. And we can see considerable phenotypic variability even between genotypically identical siblings. One point I want to make is that if you get to the diagnosis through whole exome sequencing, sometimes you may find variants in the gene that are not known to be pathogenic, so-called variants of unknown significance. They could be novel pathogenic variants in that patient, or they could be rare benign variants. So if you arrive at the diagnosis with genetic testing first, it's always going to be important to do the biochemical testing to confirm that these are truly disease-causing variants. So to measure the alpha manosidase activity and ideally to also look for the mannose-rich oligosaccharides in urine.
Well, I think, uh, again, the, it's important to be aware of the clinical manifestations and also to have some awareness of what conditions have clinical overlap with alpha manosidosis. I've mentioned multiple times the mucopolysaccharidoses because I think there is greater awareness of these disorders, and they are certainly in the differential diagnosis uh, of many patients we see with alpha manosidosis, but also other lysosomal disorders, such as you see listed on the slide, can also have quite a few overlapping features. The mucolipidoses, sialidosis, and sialuria, uh, but also some of the dysmorphic syndromes that we see. One good example is something called Cantu syndrome, where we also see coarsening of the facial features, some skeletal abnormalities, uh, but there can also be other birth defects such as heart defects that would help you in that differentiation. Uh, so I think being aware of the overlap with these other conditions would be very helpful. Having an early and accurate diagnosis is really important uh, for many reasons. It's important to uh, support uh, the best possible outcome in the disorder by uh, enabling surveillance for the multisystemic manifestations and appropriate symptom management and supportive care. Uh, it's also important, I believe, in helping patients to avoid the so-called diagnostic odyssey that many patients with rare diseases experience where they go from doctor to doctor to doctor uh, because of multiple issues and problems and really never get a, an accurate unifying diagnosis. And it's a source of ongoing frustration for many patients and families. Uh, when we think about what are the symptoms that we need to manage in the patient with manosidosis, of course, we need to be aware of the issue of immunodeficiency and recurrent infection, uh, with pneumonia being the primary cause of death in untreated patients. Uh, we also need to be aware of the hearing loss because this is something that we can ameliorate with hearing aids, for example. And this is a very consistent manifestation. Uh, we also know that uh, patients who, who don't have a diagnosis or have a delayed diagnosis and aren't treated, uh, they often have cumulative problems over time that really contribute not only to mortality, but also to a decrease in the quality of life. Uh, we know that most patients with manosidosis over time uh, do progress so that we see progressive neuromuscular disease. They eventually become wheelchair dependent in many cases. So we need to be proactive in evaluating all of these things and making sure that the patient need, gets the support and services that they need. Hello, my name is Professor Barbara Burton. I'm a professor of pediatrics at the Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine in Chicago, Illinois, USA. Thank you for joining me today for this Touch Expert Opinions, exploring how we may improve the patient journey for people living with alpha manosidosis. First, we will look at the importance of early recognition and how this can support much needed early diagnosis of alpha manosidosis. After considering the route to timely and accurate diagnosis, we will look at the role of current and emerging targeted therapies in addressing long-term needs to optimize outcomes for people living with alpha manosidosis. Well, the most important aspect of care currently is symptomatic treatment and supportive measures. Uh, we certainly aim to prevent or manage the complications that we know to be associated with alpha manosidosis. So for example, uh, hearing aids uh, are very important for patients who have 
significant hearing loss, and that is a cardinal manifestation of the disorder. And of course, that uh, prescribing hearing aids to a patient who's hearing impaired uh, certainly enables them to function optimally and also enhances the quality of life. We need regular eye exams and dental checkups. Uh, we need to pay attention to the immunodeficiency that often exists. Uh, in some cases, antibiotic prophylaxis might be considered to prevent infection. Uh, sometimes the skeletal abnormalities that we see in menocidosis require orthopedic intervention. So it's important that we're tuned in to these. Uh, in young children with developmental delay, early intervention with speech and language therapy, in some cases physical therapy or occupational therapy as well, helps them to reach their optimal potential. And because this is a serious disorder that really impacts the patient in many ways, it also impacts the family in many ways. So counseling of the family, genetic counseling, but also psychological support and counseling is extremely important for both the patient and their family members. Absolutely. Uh, multidisciplinary management is critical in alpha manocidosis, as it is in so many of our lysosomal storage disorders, which have multi-systemic manifestations. So we always need someone who's essentially the hub of the spoke or the coordinator of care, and that may be a geneticist or a metabolic specialist. In some cases, that may be the family physician um, or a pediatrician. Uh, but in addition to that, uh, we need our orthopedic specialists to address the skeletal manifestations like kyphosis. We need audiologists and ENT specialists to address the hearing loss. We've talked about the importance of therapists for early intervention, speech and language therapists, uh, physical therapists the importance of counseling. So psychologists are an important uh, part of the picture. If a patient has psychiatric manifestations, a psychiatrist might also be involved. Ophthalmologist for eye exams. So all of these are very important and there may be others. For example, at times an immunologist would be involved because of the immunodeficiency. IVIG or intravenous immunoglobulins are often given to patients to, again, ameliorate the immunodeficiency and help prevent recurrent infections. So uh, coordination of this multidisciplinary care is, is extremely important. As we think about the possibility for developing really disease-modifying or specific therapy for alpha manocytosis, there are a number of different approaches that we can discuss, as is true, again, for many of our other lysosomal disorders. Hematopoietic stem cell transplantation is one way of introducing functional enzyme-producing cells into the body through a repopulation of the hematopoietic system. And this has been utilized in uh, alpha manocytosis with some efficacy in modifying some of the clinical manifestations of the disorder. Enzyme replacement therapy is another way of addressing a disorder that's associated with a characteristic enzymatic deficiency. Again, this has been developed for alpha manocytosis uh, and is available in some countries. It's not yet proved, approved in the United States, uh, but this is available in some parts of the world. Other possible approaches would be uh, things like uh, substrate reduction therapy or pharmacologic chaperone therapy, which can uh, also help ameliorate the enzymatic deficiency in the case of chaperones or reduce substrate accumulation 
through reducing synthesis of those substrates uh, with SRT. Well, I mentioned that hematopoietic stem cell transplantation has been done in alpha manocytosis and certainly is currently available. Uh, the data are relatively limited because of the rarity of the disease, but studies that have been done show that transplantation can attenuate the CNS disease, particularly in the more severely affected patients, and can um, prolong their life uh, as well as improving function. Uh, what we see with transplantation is uh, we see uh, a decrease in pathologic lysosomal accumulation of the mannose-rich oligosaccharides, and we do see an impact on both neurologic function and skeletal development. Among the patients who've been reported to be transplanted, we see an 88% survival rate with stable engraftment, and patients may show cognitive and developmental progress following transplantation. Uh, enzyme replacement therapy has also been developed, and again, this promotes clearance of the stored substrates uh, by giving the patient an, a, an exogenous enzyme where they're not able to manufacture their own. Uh, the enzyme replacement therapy that has been developed is called velmanase alpha. And in clinical studies, this uh, showed improved biochemical and functional measures that were maintained for up to four years. There was a decrease in the, an increase in the oligosaccharide clearance, in other words, a decrease in the accumulation of the mannose-rich oligosaccharides in treated patients, as well as improved mobility, which was manifested in the clinical trials by an improvement in the three-minute stair climb test. Uh, we also saw from the clinical data that early treatment during the pediatric age group was associated with better functional outcomes. And I think it's no surprise to anyone that the earlier we treat patients with lysosomal disorders, uh, the better the response and the better the outcome. Well, I think that uh, increasingly over time, uh, we will hopefully see wider utilization of enzyme replacement therapy. And as we get uh, better recognition and diagnosis of the disorder, as we focused on in this presentation, uh, we will see these therapies being more efficacious because the earlier we treat the patient, the better the outcome. Uh, if newborn screening one day uh, comes into being for alpha manocytosis, of course, treatment could be initiated very early and prevention of clinical manifestations in a disorder like this is always more effective than reversal once they've been introduced. We also know that therapies such as hematopoietic stem cell transplantation have the greatest efficacy when performed uh, very early in the course of the disease. So regardless of how we are giving back the enzyme, it's going to be more efficacious if we can do it early. So I think uh, for physicians who might be listening to the program, really focusing on recognizing the patient as early as possible, getting to an accurate diagnosis, and considering either transplantation or if it's available in your country, uh, enzyme replacement therapy at the earliest possible time is really going to, at this point in time, give us our best possible outcomes. And then hopefully over time, we'll have additional therapies that can improve uh, the patient journey even more.